Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Twin. I am the program coordinator for Community Health Resource Center. Welcome. Um, on the slide right now, you can see my name, my um, the programs that I see oversee for CHRC, and my uh, also my email in case you'd like to get in touch if you have any questions about our health education events or our health screening events. Um, so to get us started before Dr. Lisa Polikov begins her presentation today, um, I'd like to give you a little bit of background about CHRC. Um, we've been around for over 30 years and we have four primary areas of service, nutrition, counseling, mental health services, health screening, and health education. Um, I personally, of course, look, uh, oversee health screenings and health education, which you are taking part in right now. Um, some expectations and tips for you during the presentation, just so that you know what to uh, look out for and how to best engage with us if you need to ask a question, for example. So first off, if you have a question throughout the presentation, please type your question into the Q&A or chat box. Both of those controls are found in your webinar controls uh, the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, that's, of course, if you're using Zoom through your computer. If you are uh, with us today on your tablet or smartphone, then it's also at the bottom of your screen, I believe. It's a Q&A chat box and even a hand icon, which I will talk a little bit later. If you are dialing in, um, you can you can't quite chat with us, of course, but you can hold on until the end to ask your question because we will unmute participants during that time if anyone would like to um, ask their question out loud. Now, you can also raise your hand virtually, which gives us a signal that you have maybe an urgent question um, or if you are calling in and you can't type your question, of course. So if you, you'd like to raise your hand virtually on your computer, again, it's in your webinar controls. If you are on your mobile app, then same thing, hand icon, just tap that. And if you are dialing in, you are pressing star nine. Um, you can raise your hand then. Um, once you raise your hand, I, the host, will unmute you. Um, and then you can feel free to ask your question. To unmute yourself, if you are on the phone, dial, uh, dial star six. This is what it would look like if you are on your mobile app. Um, and that's how you virtually raise your hand. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ricky Polykov. Um, she, is, she has been providing individualized health care to women for over 35 years. She is a specialist in breast cancer and treatment options. She consistently contributes to the continuing education of doctors by sharing her lectures. And of course, in addition to that, Dr. Po um, Dr. Polykov is as, has a strong passion for making health information accessible to the community. And as a matter of fact, she was actually part of uh, the handful of doctors who founded Community Health Resource Center. So um, she is one of the reasons that we are here today doing all of the work that we do with the community. And without further delay, I'd like to unshare my screen and give the floor to Dr. Ricky Polikov. Okay. Hi, everyone, and thank you for uh, TGIF with me. <laughs> Who knew that this would be entertainment on a Friday night? But it is a pleasure to be here and, and share a little bit of wisdom, and hopefully we won't interfere with dinner since we're all on Pacific Standard Time, probably. Um, but yes, I am not only one of the founding mothers of the Community Health Resource Center, but I'm also the founding director for education at our CPMC Breast Health Center. Um, I've obviously been around this medical center, enjoying the community of both um, physicians, allied health practitioners, and patients for many, many years. So tonight, um, with a little help, we'll be able to advance my slides, I thought we would talk about some of the words, the terms that we use every day that many of us, you know, maybe since high school biology haven't really hmm, thought about what they mean, and organize nutrients in terms of categories, kind of how nutritionists think about it, and maybe doctors or osteopaths, chiropractors, naturopaths, gain some insights into supplements and be aware of what's actually known through science and then what may be marketed and now has become our belief. And especially we're living a lot longer than we used to. So the anti-aging medicine is a 
a big um, interest to many of us, even as early as 35 and 40, I see women who are interested in slowing down the process of aging. They're watching their moms or they've seen their grandparents get old and older and that's, that's not a good look to them and I don't blame them. Um, so these are all reasons that the supplement industry is of great um, financial power, but also uh, an important part of decisions that we make about our own self-care. I think it's pretty confusing when you go into a vitamin shop, GNC, you know, the aisle at Whole Foods, or Pharmaca, even the grocery store, Walgreens, CVS, it's, it's all pretty mind boggling. And if you've been around as long as I've been around, in the olden days, there was one little teeny area that had vitamins, and now it may be two entire aisles. And my biggest goal really is to make sure that we protect ourselves from harm. So, you know, my mama used to say too much of a good thing is not a good thing. And that is certainly true when it comes to vitamins. So first of all, we'll get clear what a nutrient is, what is an essential nutrient. And what about minerals like zinc and magnesium? Um, you know, how do they fit into the scheme? We hear about it. Um, are deficiencies common or rare? What about essential fatty acids, EFAs? Um, are, are they hard to come by? Um, where do they live in food? And what's a vitamin anyway? What do, what do scientists actually use to define vitamins? And then there's the mystery, I call it the great black box of metabolism, how all of these processes actually occur inside the body. So we'll you know, touch very lightly on the GI tract. I mean, that's fascinating to me since I was a little kid, like how would I, how would I chew something up and swallow it and then it would turn into energy like like Popeye. <laughs> so that's part of what got me interested in medicine, actually. So um, how compounds travel around our body and get to the place they're needed, that's pretty awesome to think about that. And how do we achieve balance? And you know what, what organs do and who's the storage depot and who's the filtering um, system and all of that. And then of course, the solid waste is exited and uh, excreted in stool. So micronutrients are things for which we only need a teeny tiny bit, but we need them. They're important and they do maintain normal cell tissue and function. And if you wanna go into micromolecular biology, honestly, um, Wikipedia has some fantastic details. And if you've ever been to Wikipedia asking a question about the body, there are all these hyperlinks and you can, you can spend the rest of the weekend exploring the details. It's pretty elegant. But for today's purposes, I really want to be clear about what we absolutely know is important to guide your metabolism, to guide growth and development from, for women, especially considering pregnancy or who are pregnant. We know that there are many important elements that guide uh, embryonic development, fetal development, and lead to healthier babies. And I put at the bottom that folate in particular prevents neural tube defects, NTD. So just in the years during which I've practiced OBGYN, this is something we've learned and it's very important. And all around the world, this is a huge educational effort on the part of um, nurse practitioners, physicians, midwives to educate women preconception before they get pregnant to be sure they have adequate folate to make sure neurologic development is normal in babies. And in fact, today in Western countries and Great Britain, Europe, um, vitamin D is also on that list. We now screen for vitamin D sufficiency prior to pregnancy <clears throat> reduces birth complications and pregnancy complications when it's adequate. And the other thing we screen for is mercury excess or mercury poisoning. So um, vitamins essentially are defined as a cofactor and these are elegant processes. You can actually look it up on YouTube if you want to see your, your gut and your uh, biology working uh, on a video. It's, it is pretty interesting. And I just think anytime we learn more about our body, we're going to take better care of it because we appreciate how elegant it is. So essential nutrients are those that we do not synthesize inside our bodies at the rate that they're needed. And that's why there is a tendency or a trend now in older adults to use more supplements 
In fact, if older adults ate better in general, we probably don't need them. And it's one of the problems with research on supplements, but we'll touch on that later. We need to take food uh, or supplements with these essential nutrients because our bodies can't synthesize or make them on, their, on our own. They are sometimes minerals, these essential fatty acids, which we'll clarify very soon, these essential amino acids, vitamins that we don't make on our own. We have not that many, actually, you'll see. Um, and we're going to add to the essential vitamins, probably in this generation, vitamin D, because of the use of sunscreen. Um, but minerals mostly are abundant because plants uh, take them up from the soil and then we eat the plants. Or if you want to go higher on the food chain, the um, herbivores that eat the plants then are eaten by the omnivores and um, then you get what uh, the omnivores have. So that's why eating meat is a very efficient way to get lots of vitamins, although it's expensive for the planet. So the five major minerals in our body are calcium, phosphorus, potassium. And it's sort of funny, potassium is abbreviated with a K, but that's, that's historic and German. Anyway, and sodium is Na. These are from the periodic table of the elements, magnesium, Mg. And the other elements, so these five big guys, calcium, we always think of bones, calcium and phosphorus balance for bones. Uh, potassium, everybody knows, you wanna have a certain amount of potassium in your blood. It's important for muscles, especially for the heart muscle and the heart rhythm to be normal. That's why we pay so much attention to potassium and it's got a very tight um, maintenance level in the bloodstream. These other tiny minerals that we need are called trace elements. And they are sulfur, iron, chlorine, cobalt, copper, zinc, manganese, molybdenum, iodine, and selenium. And the only two there that most people know a fair amount about is iodine because of its use in the thyroid gland synthesizing uh, thyroid hormone. And then iron, of course, is essential to make red blood cells. And especially for women who menstruate, we have to replace the menstrual blood that's lost every month. Pregnancy takes a lot of iron out of women's bodies too. So that's another reason that it's a more important feature for women uh, generally than men to have adequate iron. The essential fatty acids are essential because once again, the body can't synthesize them. And you can see from the picture to the right, um, they are in, in uh, vegetable oils and grains. There are only two essential fatty acids, alpha linoleic or ALA, which is considered an omega-3 fatty acid. And again, it's in seeds, oils, like flaxseed, walnut, chia, hemp, and um, soy oil has it. Corn oil, I believe, also has ALA. And then linoleic, which is an omega-6 fatty acid, which is ample in sunflower oil. And so if you like sunflower seeds, you know, a lot of people like them as <laughs> some, like a nervous nibble hobby, but it's really, they're quite good for you. So vitamins have their own definition of organic compounds. Hopefully everybody's had at least enough chemistry to know an a compound is considered organic if it has carbon in it. That's really it. But anyway, that's way back probably to high school at the most college for most of us. But in any event, um, these organic compounds are required in these very small quantities because our body can't make them. And they have hundreds of functions in the body from creating strong bones to healing a wound, um, boosting your immune system, all kinds of elegant elegant processes. They are everywhere. Every tissue needs these vitamins. They also convert food into energy and repair cell damage. And that's an elegant system that, again, if you want to see the role of vitamins on the sort of magical wheel of metabolism, just put in those um, topics in your search engine on Google and or YouTube, and you'll get some beautiful images. Again, just to appreciate what all goes on in that big black box of our bodies. 
And in fact, the preponderance of medical opinion is written at the bottom of this slide. That in fact, most people of all ages get the vitamins they need if they eat a healthy diet. So how do we get stuff from the mouth? And there's a little pill or supplement coming into the mouth and going down the esophagus. And then it does this dance. And um, you can see that the stomach is sort of a pink organ that the little blue line and the arrow curves around. It's hinted in front of the stomach is the liver that goes over towards the right side. Um, and so after the stomach, a lot of the little fine wiggles, that's the small intestine, and then the, the sort of larger, more bulbous with almost a line running down the middle, that's how we draw the colon because in fact, that's about what it looks like. The small intestine is very smooth all the way and the large intestine gets larger. And of course, that's where eventually as it comes down the left side of the belly, that's where our stool is stored before it comes out the rectum and the anus and is um, excreted as stool. So the different regions of the digestive system uh, have different functions. As you probably know, the stomach has this very strong uh, hydrochloric acid or gastric acid, and that acid breaks things down and helps get them into little tiny more digestible pieces. The small intestine's major job, in fact, is to absorb nutrients. The pancreas isn't really drawn here, it's behind the stomach, but it has an exocrine function as well as making insulin, which is the endocrine function, but the exocrine pancreas makes a lot of digestive enzymes. Uh, some people, in fact, that function flags with age and there are people who benefit from taking pancreatic type enzymes. Gallbladder, that's another elegant system there. It's a little green bag sort of drawn in there right below the liver there. Um, the patient's right, it looks like the left of this person on, on your left. Anyway, and that aids in fat digestion, bile salts, bile acids. Anyway, so then there's this other thing that's on both sides of the slide, which are blood vessels and has little white dots. So that, I just put this slide up to make the point that it's kind of an act of faith that what we take in these supplements actually goes through all these wiggles and gets absorbed into the bloodstream, which is sort of like the uh, freeway system to deliver all these supplements to the organ that you're hoping to support or improve its biologic function. The public health nutrient problem, going to kind of a, a larger scope here, it looks like this. So remember I said you could get all these vitamins pretty much if you ate correctly, but 93% of people have inadequate um, levels of vitamin D and E. And the E is particularly troublesome because that's very easy to come by if you eat whole foods. 61% um, don't get the estimated average requirement of magnesium and vitamin A. You'll see where vitamin A is. It's so easy to have intake for most of us. 50% of adults don't have adequate calcium, 98% inadequate potassium. Potassium is huge in oranges, um, cantaloupe, bananas, again, fresh fruit, and 71% inadequate intake of vitamin K. So it just more says something about how poor the American diet is, not that, in fact, nutrients will will fix the problem. We'll, if we have time, we'll get into that. Um, but also, as we know, indigent subpopulations are even worse than this general data set from the United States. It's a, specifically African-Americans, obese people, and now we can see also the Hispanic Americans, especially Hispanic women, have a tremendous incidence of vitamin insufficiency in their diet. So American diets overall, we have an excess of calories, but not enough good nutrition, not enough nutrients. What people hope is that we will prevent disease. And, you know, osteoporosis, vision loss, these are very common. Um, and 
obviously if we can reduce cancer rates or heart disease rates with nutritional supplements, we would love to prove that. But will they compensate for an unhealthy lifestyle? Will they prevent me from getting old? Will they improve my performance? Help me lose weight? These are all our goals, obviously, sometimes when we have a little bit too much weight, uh, maybe getting uh, wrinkles in our skin and make me more attractive. Here's a very comprehensive list of the water-soluble vitamins, which is another way we subdivide vitamins. And that's important because it's pretty hard to overdose water-soluble vitamins because we rinse them out of our bodies in urine. Um, they're not stored in fat. So you can see that the common B vitamins, one, two, and three, pantothenic acid, um, which is very widespread in food. Most, virtually no one needs to take that separately. Biotin is something that in fact is produced in your intestinal tract and is widespread. There's a fair amount of evidence that dermatologists um, have for hair supplementation. They often prescribe uh, products with extra biotin and folic acid and pyridoxine um, and cobalamin. All these things are kind of on the um, hair vitamin list. Ascorbic acid is an antioxidant. Um, it helps to acidify urine and prevent bladder infections in women. Uh, but you can see how many foods actually contain a fair amount of vitamin C. So again, it's easy to obtain through nutrition. This is just a typical collection of B vitamins you might see. I ask patients to bring their vitamins in when they come see me in the office, and I like to look at the actual doses. And in fact, um, these B vitamins are all mostly contained very generously in food, with the exception being B12, the cobalamins, they are particularly high in meat, and so vegetarians and people who want to avoid red meat for either um, personal preferences or um, because they don't digest it well, uh, are often somewhat B12 deficient. By the way, this 50 microgram is a reasonable daily dose between 50 and 100. So if you have some B12 at home, look at the bottle and look at the label and just see this one I pulled out of my husband's medicine cabinet before this talk. Okay, that is way too much. <laughs> but he's probably safe because he never remembers to take his vitamins anyway. But, you know, that when I see 2,500 micrograms of B12, this is the sort of thing that, you know, that's really, no one should be buying that over the counter. That, that's quite excessive. So Anyway, I just think these are the things that like even the doctor's partner has the wrong thing in the medicine cabinet. But B12 carries a lot of hype. And in fact, very low or deficient B12 does associate with a higher risk in old age of movement disorders like Parkinson's disease and dementia. So again, there's some, there's some fact behind why these things are so attractive to the public. In, the other fact is that taking a supplement of a pill is ample and well absorbed by 99% of people. So why are there B12 injections? Why do you get B12 sprays or liquids or, you know, droppers to put under your tongue? Marketing. Honestly, in my belief, my very strong medical belief, there's, there's no need for B12 injections. Why they came about, and I inherited a practice of a lot of older women like in their 80s when I first started because an elderly gynecologist retired and these little ladies like to come in every month for a B12 shot. And at the ripe old age of 30, I realized, you know, it's a social call. It's, it's just part of what they've been doing. And, you know, they'd be all dressed up. My first office was way downtown and it was pretty charming. And as much as intellectually, I didn't believe in it. I cooperated and then they got their one cc of b12 1000 um, micrograms every month and i think it was part of our mental health connection and you know there's a place for science and then there's a place for being kind and supporting people's belief if it's not harmful which it's not um, but i also see it as a way that physicians can make money that's that's my opinion 
So it is extremely rare, in fact, to have difficulty absorbing this taken by mouth. Vitamin C, um, we all know citrus full of C. That's why the British Navy was called limeys because they learned that they prevented scurvy. And C was the third vitamin that was discovered, scurvy being the disease. And that's how vitamins were named, by the way. So the first vitamin discovered was vitamin A. The second was vitamin B. And the third is vitamin C. Um, too much vitamin C? Yes, it's possible. We do see more kidney stones in people with high ingestion of vitamin C. And in fact, if you've had a family member who's had a kidney stone, which is much more painful than having a baby, and you don't have the reward, you just have the pain, um, those people will often be very careful never to take more than 500 milligrams a day. So these are, again, too much of a good thing is not a good thing. Also, many people with a sensitive intestinal tract who are prone to loose bowels, they'll actually get diarrhea from 1,000 or 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C. So is it best to get it from fruits and vegetables? Uh, my belief is yes, and not necessarily just from the juice, but to actually eat the whole fruit so you have the roughage because the um, cellulose structure actually slows absorption of the sugar and actually makes it healthier for you. So these are all things about the whole food as opposed to squeezing it, the extract, the juice, or um, even more rarefied, which would be drying it and having a powder. Buffered and timed release may be easier on the stomach. Um, certainly many people who have sensitive intestines report that. The fat-soluble vitamins are the ones where we more often see toxicity, and that is because they are stored in your body fat, and they're not excreted in urine um, the way the water-soluble vitamins are. Um, we don't need a lot of these, but we need a crucial little bit, and um, they are heat stable, so you don't decrease the amount of, say, vitamin D that's in fish uh, when you cook it. The body doesn't need to have them every day. That's why some doctors use a therapeutic prescriptive dose of vitamin D, and they have you just take a whole giant uh, amount of it one day a week. Well, that's often easier for patients to remember, uh, but that's because the liver stores it and just sort of shares it, doles it out as your body needs it. Um, mega doses, which I went to college during the era of mega vitamin therapy being touted, and um, some students, you know, look kind of yellow it, it, if you have too many um, vitamin A supplements, or if you have a diet of solid carrots, you can turn your palms yellow, um, but your tissues actually look yellow too. And the same with vitamin D. If you're taking D supplements, the most common uh, cause of D overdose is actually liquid vitamin D. Um, and at CPMC, I think in 39 years, we've had four cases of uh, D overdose to the point that people came in with um, liver disease. And, you know, I happened to laparoscope a, a man <laughs> for the GI service back in the 80s to do a liver biopsy on him. Um, and in fact, he had the kind of liver disease and fibrosis you usually see with bad alcoholics. So these are things that, you know, a little bit, meaning two to 5,000 units a day, that's perfect, that's fine. That's enough and not too much. So here's vitamin A. Most people know it's carrots. Uh, it's also good for your immune system, not just for vision, but it's pretty fascinating to read about actually how vitamin A works inside the eye. It's pretty elegant. Um, but I'm a big uh, proponent, if you can, of the fresh vegetable source of vitamin A. And what you would normally consume is about the amount you need. Vitamin D is probably um, the most important vitamin to be basically a public health emergency in the United States. 30 years ago, it was thought that older women who were indoors a lot had such severe D deficiency just because they didn't go out in the sun. And they led to osteoporosis, bone loss, because if your vitamin D, as you see in the bullet point in the lower part of the screen, 
very severe D deficiency, less than a serum level of 20, um, your body absorbs calcium from bone stores to maintain a normal level of calcium in your bloodstream. So it's a little bit like when a woman's breastfeeding a baby, she pulls the extra calcium for the milk out of her bones, but that's a very short limited experience in life. And after women stop nursing, they rebuild that bone very efficiently. But older people, especially um, who are inactive, not only do they deplete the calcium in their bones, but they also don't have elastic bones because they tend to not exercise. So D deficiency has been a very expensive multi-billion dollar problem in the United States, recognized because Medicare pays all the bills for the complications of fractures. So hip fractures, you can tie them many times directly to inadequate intake of dairy. Of course, in the United States, we supplement milk with vitamin D to help you efficiently absorb the nutrients in the milk, especially the calcium. Um, we also know that D deficiency is linked to higher rates of autoimmune disorders. The most frightening for most of us would be multiple sclerosis, but lupus and Sjogren's and other autoimmune disorders are also more frequent in men and women, but especially women who are D deficient. And I really recommend you read about the hormone vitamin D because it was misnamed when it was discovered. But the disease is rickets that was discovered to be prevented with um, cod liver oil. And so that substance was vitamin D and then it was purified. So vitamin E, I've mentioned um, 35, 40 years ago, this was touted as a sexual uh, enhancer, an aphrodisiac that's been completely disproven. And in fact, vitamin E supplementation is pretty rarely needed. Um, there are some studies that show that topical vitamin E, when mixed with other essential oils for skin healing after a burn, may be helpful. But you can see the foods that have vitamin E in them, pretty numerous. So it's pretty easy for most of us to have adequate E. And in fact, too much E can cause um, the activity of blood thinning agents like Coumadin um, to cause too much bleeding. And sometimes people on cholesterol medications, the statins, they also have toxicities with vitamin E supplementation. Vitamin K is another one that is fat soluble. It's actually made by bacteria in the intestine. Another fascinating current evolving body of knowledge, which is amazingly how much um, the biome or this balance of the healthy bacteria in your intestines, they actually are working as your friends. Um, so vitamin K helps produce good bone health. That includes your teeth but also um, the bloodstream and kidneys. So you can see the good sources, that little K is made up of them, leafy greens and um, cabbage and broccoli, certain vegetables, and you can see even kiwi has a fair amount of vitamin K in it. So it's sort of fun to see how many of our beautiful vegetables and fruits actually have each one just packed with vitamins. Um, so again, just to summarize, the fat-soluble vitamins are stored in the body for a long time, particularly stored in the liver, and therefore pose a greater risk for toxicity, like that patient I, I helped with the liver biopsy, had fibrosis from the inflammation that too much um, vitamin D caused. Beta-carotene, another antioxidant vitamin, um, ample in, our, in most good diets. Vitamin D being the one that will continue to be a mounting problem because we use sunscreen and we want to prevent skin cancer and I'm all for that. And so it's absolutely essential for most of us to, because most of us don't like cod liver oil, which is packed with vitamin D. So we do need to take a supplement. And at the end, I do recommend again, two to 5,000 a day. Um, E is an antioxidant, but again, you get ample vitamin E in food. 
they do put a little bit of E in multivitamins and you'll never be poisoned by the amount you see in a Centrum or Trader Joe's um, multivitamin with, with minerals. Um, now on to supplements. So supplements can include vitamins, but now we're talking more about the categories of supplements that are touted as herbal or specialty supplements, vitamins and minerals that help with sexual performance, losing weight, or sports bodybuilding. Um, and this is where, you know, we get into a lot more hazard. Um, this is the dream, the wish, you take the supplement and you, know, you get your six pack. But this industry is, I feel very much out of control. Uh, this is 2014 data, 36.7 billion on these three, weight loss, muscle building and sexual function. And what's sad to me is that there's no medical evidence that they work. And this is a very exhaustive review that I pulled up from 2017 preventive medicine reports. And these studies are enormous. And it's, by the way, very hard to actually get the correct number in terms of how many billion dollars Americans actually spend um, because the industry is intentionally very difficult to track. But this number, 36.7 billion, 2014, is approximately the same number that Medicare spent repairing all the broken hips across the United States in that year. So that's a tremendous amount of money. Um, and this is all discretionary spending out of people's pocketbooks. And I always wonder, well, if they'd spent the money on fresh fruit and vegetables, they would have been healthier and not have any toxicity, which that's the shadow side of a lot of these supplements. Um, is the impurities that are in them. So this is the medical public health perspective, and this is a big publication from the U.S. Food and Drug um, that these are not medically recommended, have sh been shown to be ineffective. And unfortunately, these are exactly the supplements, the weight loss, muscle building, and, and sexual function that often are tainted with toxic ingredients in the the side effects with those toxic ingredients and how we know this is from uh, uh, toxicity screening through emergency rooms and you know they'll do a prospective study and everybody that has a certain diagnosis then they pull up their actual lab results and then they can see you know what the adverse events were so it's very rare um, it's half to 1% of users, but when you have millions and millions of users, especially when you're on other prescribed medications, either for um, heart rhythms, if people have atrial fibrillation or flutter, anyway, high blood pressure, cholesterol issues, I mean, some of the side effects are pretty scary. And my concern is, why have any risk of a side effect if something's really not effective? So that's, that's my strong urging in terms of sort of bodybuilding over-the-counter stuff. But can supplements make us smarter? Um, some people on this webinar probably know about the Bredesen protocol or some of the risk reduction strategies for uh, dementia risk reduction. And there are several things on that list, one of which, by the way, is B12, another is D, and their recommendation, pretty much all the protocols embrace 5,000 of D. Um, thus far, the only thing that has been really independently shown to reduce anxiety in a double-blinded trial is pure St. John's wort, which actually is very similar to Prozac. Um, so my personal feeling is we have better control over a an FDA supervised and produced medication than you have over St. John's Ward. Again, because most of us can't do the diligence to know exactly what is in um, this particular bottle of St. John's Ward because there's no guarantee of purity because it hasn't gone through the 12 steps of purity and content analysis that's required 
for any prescription medication. We do know that better sleep reduces dementia risk and better mood, less anxiety, less depression do reduce dementia risk. But this, these two supplements would not be my path to reducing dementia risk. So does this supplement that I'm going to take actually travel to the place where it's supposed to do its good work? So that's kind of back to that first picture we had of the pill going into the throat and then down the esophagus, stomach, et cetera, and making the journey, making the rounds, so to speak, around the body. So um, this is where, again, science says, no, they actually don't get to where we want them to work. A particularly interesting study, I didn't put it in the slide set, but it reminds me of a study on CoQ10. Well, for, for a very certain population of people who have high risk for heart disease, CoQ10 as an antioxidant can help lower their risk, but it never lowers their risk as much as changing their diet and increasing their exercise. So, you know, I look at what's good for all the systems of the body, reducing cancer, reducing heart disease risk, reducing dementia risk. It's not the pill. It's not going to be the CoQ10. It's going to be the cardio, and it's going to be the fresh air and just the, the total body enhancement of being in nature. So if I sound kind of repetitious, like lifestyle, 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 that's because, in fact, that's what has clearly been shown to reduce risk for cancer, heart disease, and uh, cognitive decline. Of great concern is the supplements that actually contain something harmful. We had the example about 20 years ago when coral calcium was advertised on TV. It became a rage. And of course, what would you think? Corals from the bottom of the sea and where would heavy metals rest? In coral. And so they were harvesting dead coral full of mercury and lead. And so we had a little epidemic locally of uh, heavy metal poisoning. By the way, one of the um, symptoms of heavy metal excess is hair loss. So that's why we picked this up because women came in um, because they were concerned about going bald. Um, so over-the-counter marketing for weight loss, these I just listed some of the product names. Probably the most frequent are the carnitine and chromium picolinate. Um, I remember years ago watching Dr. Oz holding up some bottles advertising these. They don't work. Um, and worse, they can also be adulterated. Something else can be in the bottle. So I would certainly save your money. And then, of course, there are rare cases of liver and kidney failure um, with a lot of GI side effects, a lot of indigestion. The energy boost uh, family, uh, these can get pretty dangerous because they often sneak in some sympathomimetics, um, which may accelerate heart rates. Yohimbe used to be, again, about 10 years ago, there's a Yohimbe uh, toxicity epidemic and pretty severe problems. That's you know now illegal in the United States. I don't know how many products still have it, but these are things when you've been in practice a long time, especially with the recreational drug use that's pretty prevalent. Um, some of these drug 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 herb interactions are pretty scary. So sexual performance, we actually have some pretty good. Um, FDA approved products now, and I put on this list by Agrocellus and Levitra for men, there are some women who use these for clitoral enhancement, but um, the $16 billion consumer spending on um, sexual enhancement aphrodisiacs is mostly by men with erectile dysfunction. Um, and part of that may be with the wish that it's a little cheaper than um, Viagra, Cialis, or Levitra that are now very expensive. Um, but again, prevention is the key. <clears throat> so whatever's good for your arteries to keep them open, um, which is exercise and low saturated fat diet, uh, will help your penile artery stay patent and help your erections lifelong. Women have a little different road to hoe because of um, 
menopause. So that's a whole separate chapter. We can have a whole separate lecture, but unsupported menopause, meaning not taking any estrogen, the blood flow to the pelvis itself decreases in women universally and the tissues get very thin and atrophic. So um, there is no over-the-counter supplement that fixes that. There are some products by the Bonafide company that actually work quite well to increase blood flow. Um, and they interestingly must be prescribed by a physician. I don't know why they require prescription, but they are herbals that work beautifully and are very pure. But that's, that's the only category uh, by Bonafide. You can look it up um, if you're interested. They have a great website. Um, herbal blends. I, I love Ayurveda. I very much TCM is traditional Chinese medicine or acupuncture and herbs. One of our problems, again, is purity of the herbs. And you probably can imagine where many herbs are grown in Asia, the water and the soil and the air, especially when they're grown in parts of Thailand and China, um, are quite risky. So without a practitioner actually checking your pulses and rendering an opinion, we don't use traditional medicines like going and buying vitamin C. The herbal remedy for an individual really depends on accurate measurement of our pulses. If you're going to use a traditional medicine, I think it should be used in the context of the wisdom in which it was developed. So we also need this extra level of certitude of what is really in these herbs. And if we're going to boil them, um, are we going to leach out some potential impurities or pesticides? So this area is really fraught with hazard. And, you know, three blocks from my house, there's a wonderful Chinese medicine center and um, beautiful drawers of elegantly labeled herbs. I have no idea how I would be certain that herbal remedies that are, they look great, you know, all these different barks and seeds are put onto a piece of paper and folded up and you're supposed to boil them. <clears throat> but, you know, what's in that? So um, lastly, there was an epidemic about 20 years ago of some animal extract products for, quote, adrenal support. Turned out they were from cows and you've probably heard of bovine encephalitis. Anyway, these prions were identified. And so these over-the-counter herbal, quote herbal, but adrenal supports uh, were contaminated with um, virus that became active in humans. So here's a conclusion from our National Institute of Health. And, you know, there's a big backlash against <laughs> the FDA and the NIH, but, you know, they were kind of established to protect us, actually, and they do mean well, and they do have some great public health information. But basically, the final bottom line is that um, multivitamins without regulatory authority is kind of caveat emptor. So my recommendation is with a giant data set, and this is many data sets, here's the consensus statement from 2006. But if you're going to take something every day, demand from the manufacturer, whatever brand you've chosen, their purity analysis data. If you go to a big company like Centrum, you're going to get that. Um, and honestly, you would assume Trader Joe's or a big company like Safeway or CVS, that their you know, sort of generic brand would be good, but I don't know that. If you're going to buy those products, I would highly recommend that you um, do your diligence and do no harm to yourself. We don't have any evidence in the United States, significant evidence that there was any decrease in cancer in these 27,658 men that were studied. And this is a pretty recent clinical trial. Larger study looking at women, 324,000. No clear evidence of benefit or harm, except, and this is an interesting thing, Beta carotene supplementation does increase lung cancer risk in smokers. And by the way, it increases lung cancer risk in men and women who smoke. Of course, my bottom line is 
nobody should smoke. But you know, for your, you may have friends or family that smoke. They should not take vitamin A. So, um, and the other thing is really no significant difference in multivitamin supplements and cardiovascular disease. So here's a divergent uh, think tank group. And actually several of these people are local. Um, Bruce Ames, some of you may have heard that. He used to be at UC Berkeley. Now he's at the um, Children's Hospital Research Center over in Oakland. But he's a pretty brilliant guy and he's a very independent thinker. In fact, all these people listed here are independent thinkers. Um, and only uh, Walter C. is actually a, an MD. The others are all PhDs. But I agree with these people that multivitamins fill nutritional gaps. And there are nutritional gaps. We know that, unfortunately. I showed you that slide early on. Um, and non-physiologic doses of supplements should be avoided. And that's, you know, that's that caveat, the warning that these systems are an elegant balance. And when we flood the system with way more of a certain vitamin, um, we may create, in fact, imbalance. So that's why I trust food. It's how we crawled out of the cave. It's what was in our diet 20,000 years ago. It's what was in our diet 2,000 years ago and 200 years ago. And I think being in medicine this long, I can report that we have to get back to simple. And simple with a few exceptions like vitamin D because we don't want skin cancer. So forever, everyone is advised to use sunscreens and avoid sun exposure. And so you must take vitamin D because you normally would keep synthesizing vitamin D through your skin with the sun shining on it until your blood level reached 100. Then magically, the enzymes that synthesize vitamin D turn off and they deactivate vitamin D. So the skin is amazing in its ability to know and sense, oh, should my enzyme turn on or turn off? But when you flood your system with too many millions of units of vitamin D, like I've had patients that took 50,000 a day instead of 50,000 a week. So 50,000 a day, you definitely get vitamin D toxic. Anyway, but this is where a little is not only good, it's essential. But it's best, preferably, to get your nutrients from organic food, and not wrapped in plastic. I think there's another level of consideration, which is about the energy that's contained in food as a whole fruit or a whole leaf or a whole broccoli stem, as opposed to dried powders. Um, we look at glycemic index, that's a whole other topic, how your blood sugar is affected by certain foods. We know that the structure of the intact food slows absorption of nutrients. In fact, it slows it in a manner that avoids high blood sugar and also enhances your ability to digest that food. So there's a lot that we're sort of going back to nature over time. Strict vegetarians who, females with menstrual periods or pregnancy, definitely should check iron store adequacy because most women never replace the iron that they lost through their menses or their pregnancies. Uh, it's very rare that men are iron deficient, but because uh, iron stores are your, um, I call it your resource in case of accidental <laughs> hemorrhage. And if you have iron stored up in your bone marrow, you'll make new red cells very quickly and maybe avoid a transfusion. And lastly, my firm belief is that we are all our own primary care providers. And appreciating the gift of life being in a body, caring about the foods that we eat, exercising regularly, consuming water in ample amount, and just being mindful that you're not a machine. You're this awesome being. And I tell my patients, I just treat myself like one of the kids. You know, I never put anything in my daughter's mouth when she was a baby or a child or a teenager that wasn't good for her. And so why should I treat myself any differently? 
And I, I hope to leave you all with that inspiration that you're, you're a miracle walking on two legs. <laughs> and, and with that, um, if we get back to basics and kind of let the body exercise its wisdom, I think we'll all be a little healthier for it. So I'd like to open up to questions. And uh, I don't know if uh, Twen has um, got some in the chat, but here are kind of the, the things that are kind of the sound bite to take home. Um, evidence is really insufficient to prove that there are benefits from multivitamins and minerals to prevent cancer and chronic disease. Though, if you have a lousy diet, clearly multivitamins help to fill in the gap. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Polycone. We actually have a lot of questions, I think. So, um, could you give an example of heavy metal poisoning? Um, well, mercury is the most common, mercury and lead. Um, and mercury, I mentioned, I alluded to it before with the uh, mercury that was collected in coral and then people buying coral calcium um, as a source of you know, calcium to make strong bones. So that was our sort of most dire shocker because the other um, element that was in the coral calcium uh, supplements was a fair amount of lead. Lead poisoning, heavy metal, is also something we see, of course, tragically with children who pick up chips of paint or sometimes when they, in the olden days, they would sandblast uh, homes to get off the old paint or even power wash with water. And so the particles would fall into the soil and then you know kids are playing and they've got their little sand buckets. Anyway, so that's a, been a major source. And so of course that hits all neighborhoods, but especially um, older neighborhoods, which tended to become more minority neighborhoods. So those are the most common heavy metals. We also can see um, every now and then we see some arsenic poisoning because you know, somebody's got a little arsenic in their well. So um, that's another um, interesting subset. But most of us living in the city, uh, we don't have well water. Um, but it's easy. Most people, by the way, um, do not need chelation if they just stop. Their predatory fish is the major source of mercury poisoning. Um, mercury falls by half usually every month. So for example, the ideal level is five or less on the heavy metal serum screen blood test. If you're 10, that's acceptable. If you're 18, you need to look carefully at usually it's predatory or farm raised fish. And predatory fish are the fish, the big fish that eat the little fish. So halibut, tuna, and uh, swordfish are the classics. The sad news is most of the fish, like opaka paka and ma, mai mai in Hawaii, which none of us are going to be going to Hawaii anytime soon, but anyway, they tend to be high mercury fish as well. In fact, the whole Pacific Ocean is higher mercury because of um, China, we think. But in any event, unfortunately, wild caught West Coast salmon, um, even Alaskan salmon, have a fair amount of mercury and very few stores actually post mercury content. A very good website to educate you that's totally reliable. It's actually run by the um, Monterey Bay Aquarium is called Seafood Watch and you'll get great guidance but basically avoid farm-raised fish which is sad because of course a lot of fish are farm-raised or farm-raised trout. Natural trout, low mercury farm-raised trout because they're feeding the fish little fish. So it turns those fish that are raised on the farm into little predatory fish. That's the level of mercury in their flesh. Interestingly, there are a couple fisheries now that are farming fish, but they use vegetarian pellets. So they'll, they have that on their label, but you can learn their names and which stores sell them at Seafood Watch. Okay. So the minimum you can take for vitamins, I'm so glad somebody asked that. 
that's my favorite question, <laughs> um, it would be really vitamin D. And it, my minimum is 5,000 a day. Some doctors will disagree with me because they look at the spread on the vitamin norms in our labs and it says 30 to 100. And then there's a study that came out now about seven, eight years ago by the Institute of Medicine. Terrible study, but anyway, and the Institute of Medicine isn't even really a national, it's not a government organization. It's appointed by people, I think my opinion is it's very political, but anyway, it carries, um, uh, it carries a, um, a warning, <laughs> which is that when vitamin D levels were higher in older adults, they saw more disease. Well, I think to apply that study, which was a two-year study in people between age 72 and 74, so at the end of the study, they were 74 to 76, it bears no resemblance to my population. If you look at all the other data, you know, people who are outside and don't use sunscreen, they keep synthesizing vitamin D until it's 100. Then you look at the distribution of autoimmune diseases. That's how I come up with 5,000 a day. Most of us wind up with a vitamin D level around 50 to 60. And if you forget now and then, maybe it's gonna sag to 40 or 45. You're never gonna get vitamin D poisoning at 5,000 a day. But at 2,000 a day, you will never be um, D deficient. But because vitamin D, as I said, it's really a hormone and it is very active in the brain and it's active for mood. And again, I only know this because I consult uh, with the Hormone and Mood Clinic in the psychiatry department at UCSF. And, um, so there's a lot of literature on vitamin D and mood. And so in women who are prone to depression or anxiety, they can have a significantly improved quality of life when they actually take about 5,000 of D a day and get their levels up. So, you know, part of this is anecdotal, watching women improve, but that's because actually there's literature on that. And now we know the area in the brain, which is why it is also recommended for dementia risk reduction. And the, I mentioned earlier in the talk, 5,000 days, the dementia risk reduction. Okay, and then here's a, here's a really great one. Uh, oh, by the way, I would also say, for, especially for women, a little vitamin C every day, because a lot of people you don't have an orange in the fridge, and you know, it really does help to prevent bladder infections, to have a little more acidification of your urine. You don't have to go overboard, but for women in particular, um, low vitamin C, 500 to 1,000 a day, usually won't cause a side effect that's um, like loose bowels, but it can help to acidify urine, prevent bacteria from growing, which prevents infection. Um, I do think a multivitamin is, for most people, probably a pretty good insurance policy. I mean, I, I love to go to the grocery store, even during COVID. I like to admire all the organic fruits and veggies. And um, I, I don't take a multivitamin. I only take a vitamin D and I take a vitamin C. But I don't think there's any harm. The doses in multivitamins will never poison you as long as it's not a mega vitamin. And that's why, in fact, I, I don't plug Centrum Centrum is a pretty good vitamin, actually, if you look at the content. Centrum Silver, they take the iron out of the vitamin because we know that as people age, they don't need more iron once women stop menstruating. And men almost never need a lot more iron. Uh, again, part of that is because you get plenty of iron eating meat, chicken, um, pork, uh, lamb. And there's actually iron in many vegetables and fruits, you just don't absorb it as efficiently. Um, okay, you know, organic foods, is that important? Again, uh, Journal of American Medical Association about 10, 12 years ago published a clinical study, two-year two -year study, that's pretty short, but, you know, really bright people on the paper, um, and they concluded it made no difference. Well, I think that's very short-sighted. I just am so impressed by human beings evolving with pretty harsh living conditions, and yet we 
we landed on the planet, we crawled out of the cave, we set up social groupings. It was organic food, that's all we had. I honestly think to turn this around is what we need to do. So the older I get, the more my point of view is, the less adulterated, for example, I'm totally against Roundup being the agent that must be applied in order for seeds to germinate. I don't know if you're aware of this with a lot of crops, Roundup being a um, weed killer, but we have terrible policies in the United States. It's pretty heartbreaking. If you look at what the EU does, um, it's much more sensible because the European Union's number one, protect the population. The United States, in case you haven't noticed, is more and more run by corporate interests. And big ag, big agriculture has really adulterated the food system. And unfortunately, we now know all sorts of things, which I, I'm sad, but it's the truth that all this stuff packaged in plastic, we have little micro beads of plastic that now coat a lot of food. And as with many things, um, that doesn't look as though it's as innocuous as you and I would wish. So I do think choosing organic should be our default. I know there are lots of parts of our country where you can't get organic. So just do your best to wash foods. There are lists online that are quite reliable. If you put in the dirty dozen, um, you know, what are the dirty dozen foods most contaminated? You'll get the 12 that you really should, if you're going to eat them, you should only eat organic. And I think the data behind that is very solid. This data started to arise 20 years ago because of infertility. So there are many aspects of pesticides that actually do mimic hormones. And I remember I was on my way to a medical meeting from the airport and I was sharing a taxi with an infertility specialist who was at UC Davis. Well, what does UC Davis has? have? Has a big agriculture school. So anyway, I think it's fascinating um, that, that now this is absolutely, we know this is true, uh, that these compounds in pesticides and artificial fertilizers can imitate um, hormones and their hormone endocrine disruptors is what they're called. So anyway, um, caveat, you know, another warning. So fish oil is a good supplement to prevent heart disease, but if you uh, saw the, the essential fatty acids and the omega-3s, you know, you could do the fish oil, again, presuming whatever source of fish oil you have is not gonna have mercury in it too. We've had that happen also. Rather recently, I had a patient whose mercury was 23, and the only thing that could have caused it because she didn't eat fish was her, you know, her um, essential <laughs> good nutrition fish oil supplement to lower her risk of heart disease. And by the way, if your cholesterol is good and um, your blood pressure is normal, this is another interesting thing. We don't see any further reduction in heart disease by the addition of a lot of omega-3 fatty acids. So it's kind of neat. It's like the CoQ10 story. If you're low risk, CoQ10 doesn't lower your risk further. So uh, next question is for broccoli. Um, broccoli is a very powerful antioxidant. And you, if you look through the slide set, which you're all gonna get the slide set if you wanna click on something after our talk is done, you can go back to those slides and you'll just see the, the numerous vegetables that you probably like and fruits too, that have all these fantastic antioxidants in them. Um, and so, we do recommend um, antioxidants, not just for healing and lowering risk of recurrence after breast cancer, but for every tissue in your body, they heal better and they stay healthy, um, I would say longer, um, when we have good antioxidant vegetables, like broccoli is just pretty fantastic because it also has a lot of calcium in it. So, um, and it also is, it's been shown to reduce colon cancer, again, the whole broccoli, not an extract of broccoli. Um, 
Okay, grass-fed collagen as in bone broth or in powder form. So, I, you know, Ayurveda is an ancient, like five and a half thousand year old um, pulse diagnosis, looks at your tongue, looks at your urine, really a pretty brilliant system, has a lot of the elements of traditional Chinese medicine, but because it's more like the Indian diet, it's been much easier for many Americans to sort of get their herbal suggestions in their foods through Ayurveda. But um, my concern about bone broth right now, it's such a trend. It's kind of the rage. I kind of don't trust anything in powder form. And that's a bummer because, you know, that would be a lot easier. Um, and grass-fed collagen as found in bone broth would indicate maybe that this is a um, less pesticide exposed animal. And so when you make bone broth from that animal's bones, you're going to have, you know, less pollutant in it. And of course, um, so much of this we take on faith because foods have relatively poor supervision from you know farm to table so i definitely think all those stages in between where someone else has basically um butchered these animals maybe then bones and everything was thrown into a freezer then another truck picks up this probably plastic wrapped you know giant um, bits of bone and then some kitchen somewhere is going to be the prep i mean you, there's trust 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 at every stage that someone that's not you is handling that so that's why i'm just such a skeptic it's a great question my daughter makes her own bone broth it does a Appear to have helped her. She was having terrible rosacea, um, and it does. Who knows what's helping? But anyway, she does it all herself uh, from the you know organic bones that she buys at the farmers market. So I trust that more than I would trust anything. Unfortunately, that um, I'd buy at a health food store because I don't have enough confidence in purity and reliability um, from the studies we have done. Um, a woman who unfortunately died um, a couple of years ago, but she, she was head of the Continental Medicine Institute at uh, Columbia in New York, Freddie Cronenberg, fabulous woman. And she did all these kinds of studies for many years. And she'd go herself to the same organic, quote, or, you know, nutrition shops in New York City and the environment. And she would buy products and then do purity testing. And Freddie's work more than... Um, made me a skeptic because you could see and you know she did the progesterone creams too that was one of her publications so um, this is where if you're doing something for health try and as much as possible you know maybe buy yourself one of those new super pots that you can make your own bone broth much more easily and you know spend your money on that purchase which I guess are not that expensive and um, then you can put it in the freezer and you know exactly who who did everything to it um so i take a vitamin c supplement in part although i love to eat at least one citrus fruit every day but it's really for knowing that it acidifies my urine you know no one in my family had a kidney stone i've never had a kidney stone i drink a lot of water um but that's my number one it may help me a beat the common cold that was linus pauling's book that came out when i was in college so i've been a devotee of the you know the public lay press vitamin um, controversies since very young and i do think that you know the natural intake of vitamin c was probably about a thousand to fifteen hundred a day if you just look at the berries and the fruits that we gathered and we ate so for most people you know by the way um Peppers, sweet peppers, red, green, yellow, uh, have a lot of vitamin C in them. So it's sort of fun to see, oh my gosh, you really don't need much vitamin supplementation if you eat sort of all the colors of the rainbow. Okay, now here's one. 
the myth of dairy products causing cancer. There's always a reason probably that I can come up with that would give me some idea of where that came from. So in some people, particularly asthmatics or hyperallergic humans, and we all have, you know, friends that have this sensitivity to dairy, they have more phlegm. There are people who um, honestly do increase their inflammation. So their arthritis may be worse when they eat dairy. And the whole advent of the gluten-free, dairy-free for certain people uh, clearly reduces inflammation. So the segue I could see, although I've never seen a study of dairy-rich diets having more cancer, I could imagine if your body's reaction to dairy, and by the way, cow, unfortunately, is the most likely to cause um, lactose problems or inflammatory problems. It also has a less uh, ideal fat, dairy fat from cows, different from dairy fat from sheep, different from dairy fat from goats. So goat milk for many people um, has been preferred because it is, quote, less prone to cause inflammation, but also is less endowed with the kind of animal fat that converts to lousy or LDL cholesterol. So that's, again, it's part of in that, you know, probably gray zone, but I honestly think that's maybe where the myth came from is the, the, the sensitive, the lactose gluten sensitive people who do better when they omit, they go on, on these um, food elimination diets and they do better. And especially if you have something like rosacea and your skin's better, well, you're maybe in that group of people. I think what we're learning now is that we're seeing a lot more of these sort of chronic, I would call them food intolerances, like the gluten story, because we didn't used to eat grains. We didn't used to eat them much at all, if you think about it, until the Egyptians cultivated wheat. You know, we had a very different exposure for our gut. So I think it's pretty fascinating People say to me, well, look, the Italians have been eating pasta for years. Yeah, well, the Italian civilization, okay, the Etruscans preceded the Italians. Now we're getting into the era way before there was pasta. So, you know, I look at lifespan, which we can achieve now. Average lifespan is approximately 80, pretty close for men and women. Women, women have been going down, actually, and men have been going up as they've stopped smoking and um hopefully drink less and, you know, kill each other with firearms less. But it's really the lifespan that has allowed us to see this cumulative effect of not so good self-care. When we mostly were dead by age 50, for example, for women, I know this data very well, in 1800, only 5% of women lived to be 50. That you know, that is so shocking. And that is true. If you go to the old census from the colonies to the new republic, which is kept and it's on, on the public, uh, you can get it from the University of Virginia in their archives. And of course, I've sat there and I've done this because I couldn't believe that truth, but it is true. So if 95% of us used to be dead by 50, longevity is a new opportunity. And so that's part of why I think we have to wake up. I say, wake up and smell the disability. She's coming at you because we have to take a more active or proactive interest in this elegant, fine, balanced organism that is us that used to only live about 32 years, the time of the historic Jesus, that was our life expectancy. So now that I have this opportunity to hang out and be around, you know, the last thing I want is to be disabled and hanging around. Obviously, we all feel that. And that's why I think the fear of dementia has way eclipsed for many, many of my patients what used to be the fear of breast cancer, because mostly we cure breast cancer. But as far as we know right now, once we start dementing, the best we can do is to slow the process. So I've kind of shifted my public health 
dialogue to inspire people to be vigorous and healthy with minimum disabilities by kind of going back to nature. And I respect mother nature. I, you know, my, my battle cry for birth is think like a peasant because in societies that don't have morphine and epidurals, their cesarean section rate's pretty low. But also in those societies, those earlier societies of humans, we were never overweight. We were active, we were on the run. So that's the part about exercise. And whether I feel like it or not, I just treat myself, as I say, like one of the kids and you take kids to the playground because it's good for them. So it's my stationary bike. You know, I love her because I can read the newspaper, or listen to a podcast, get some cardio. Um, you know, so these are the little things we all have to figure out how I'm going to take ancient wisdom, which is what my body has, and I'm going to modify my modern lifestyle so that maybe I'll be blessed to go the distance and uh, be vigorous and vital for the whole time I'm hanging out here. Okay. Dr. Polyko, it seems that we have uh, two more questions in the chat box. Okay. Uh, one of them is actually about collagen again, and I think this one wanted to, this question wanted to focus on just um, ingestion or just using it personally. Yeah. And the next question is oh. about um, anti-aging. Right. So um, collagen, honestly, by eating it, by consuming it in my gut, I cannot fathom how I'm actually going to deposit it and, you know, do away with crow's feet. That makes no, you know, absorption, metabolism, distribution sense to me. So I'm very skeptical about all these collagen supplements, really. Um, also the dermis, you know, the skin's number one job is to keep bad stuff out and keep the good stuff in. Well, so that means it's a barrier. And so it's part of why dermatologists have to inject stuff under your skin, into your skin, if they're really going to get rid of some of this fine, crepey stuff. So um, I don't, you know, and of course, I wish I had, you know, some of my famous dermatologist colleagues from my building here because they may just shoot me down. But intellectually, from a scientific perspective, I, I you know, eating collagen is would be just another food source. Like I can eat all the all the beef tendon and <laughs> you know gristle. I don't think it makes me look any better. So, you know, that's that's all collagen too. So, um, anyway, I think fortunately we can inject things under our skin, and and it as long as it's done carefully, um, we don't reject it. It, d it doesn't cause. Uh, horrible disfiguring reactions in 99.5% of women, but there are a few women that do have adverse reactions to collagen. They go away with time, but that's, you know, one of those things you hate to pay a thousand dollars a cheek and then, you know, get an allergic reaction. Um, so, but collagen's fascinating. I don't think we're there yet. Um, at least not with the digestion processes that I understand. The last question here I see is a good one. Um, resveratrol, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's, it's that factor in grapes and wine that is an antioxidant. And this other um, compound that's mentioned, Truniagen, that's a nicotinamide riboside supplement. Again, these are sort of for anti-aging, uh, heart disease, risk reduction. I look at a specifically at a blood test called cardiospecific C-reactive protein, or CRP. Um, a lot of clinicians don't look at it because it's a secondary marker. There's a lot of discussion. But generally, it measures in most of us how much inflammation is going on in our blood vessels. It can be falsely affected sometimes by supplements, actually, or like women on birth control hormones their CRP may be up, but that's false. It's not a significant reaction. It's just what the, the liver makes more of a certain protein, and we measure it in that particular assay, but it does not increase their heart disease. But anyway, so obviously you can't just use this test blind, but I look at that factor as an indicator. So less than three is normal, 
one or less is golden. So if people have a C dash CRP of one or less, I, I intellectually cannot imagine that they're going to do even better if they take this sexy supplement. Again, it's for anti-aging, but what we look at are kind of the surrogate um, correlates of aging. So what ages us is high oxidative demand. <clears throat> and what causes that, you can look that up. These are great, great topics on Wikipedia to really get the depth. But the major thing that you blast everywhere when you exercise and you sweat for 20 minutes, you have just saturated your body in antioxidant metabolism. So that's where, that's so much better because it vasodilates everything. It improves blood flow. One of the interesting factors is actually blood flow to the breast and the pelvis because that's how you bring oxygen to those tissues and oxygen is good for everybody. So anyway, I, I just don't think we're gonna get away from needing to do cardio on a regular basis. And if I do cardio, which I need anyway, are the um, true niogen resveratrol gonna help beyond? That's a trouble because healthy people are taking these healthy supplements. And I think that's part of why we haven't validated them. Just the users are already healthier. So tricky. Thank you so much, Dr. Polico, for that honest and holistic talk and your passionate responses to participants. Um, to our participants, before we completely sign off, I wanted to let you know that Dr. Polico is speaking with the Jersey two more times this fall. Uh, the first time will be in October. She is talking with another breast health expert, Dr. Ann Pellet of CPMC Breast Care Team to bring you a, a talk titled Breast Health, Lifestyle, Screening, and Early Detection. Um, Dr. Polico's final talk with CHRC this fall is in November. She is teaming up with two of our registered dietitians to give you a talk titled Lifestyle is Your Primary Care Provider. It's a, a more in line with this, part, uh, this presentation and we'll definitely go more in depth uh, with, and please bring your questions. Dr. Polikov, is there anything you'd like to leave our participants with before we all sign off? Bon santé. Good health to you all. <laughs> Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope the air quality is better wherever you are. Take care. Thank you for attending. <laughs>